uh, cortical surface based uh, reconstruction of MEG and EEG data. So uh, first I just wanna quickly go over uh, the inverse problem in general. So going from uh, MEG or EEG sensor data to source activity. And then I'll, I'll quickly go over some popular source inversion algorithms. I won't spend too much time on, on these two things because um, if you're interested in learning more in depth about that or, or how to use SPM in general, uh, there are a lot of really good um, courses out there, including the, the SPM MEG course, uh, as well as the field trip course, which would be relevant. And I think a lot of those lectures and the slides are online. Uh, and then I'll go into yeah, how to do source inversion using cortical sur surfaces. And I'll, I'll focus on, on that, that technique as opposed to like dipole modeling or, or volume-based source reconstruction. And then uh, towards the end of the talk, I'll talk about some recent studies that, that I came out with um, in using multiple surfaces to do laminar comparisons. So to figure out if activity is coming from deep or superficial cortical layers. And then also how you can use multiple surfaces to estimate the orientation of cortical columns, um, which may improve uh, source localization. So first, just a bit about source activity. So uh, as many of you probably know, uh, what we measure when we measure uh, using MEG and EEG, where what we can observe from the scalp is basically the, the synchronous and additive activity of, of large populations of nearby neurons. And so here you can see a sort of a, a diagram of a cortical column, and, and you can model this sort of activity as a, as a current dipole, which is just two opposite, the opposite charges uh, separated by some distance. And we can characterize these dipoles um, by different parameters. So for example, we can talk about where's the location of the dipole, uh, where is its orientation, so which, which way is it pointing in the brain, and the strength of that dipole. So there are a few different ways to, to model source activity uh, when doing source reconstruction. So we can do it using equivalent current dipoles, and the idea here is that you model a one or, or just a few activated sources. And each of those sources corresponds to a fairly large brain area. Uh, and each source is modeled here as a single current dipole. So for example, you could model the, the early response to auditory stimuli by using one or, or just a few dipoles uh, in different parts of the brain. And, and what's nice about this is that there's only a few parameters to be estimated. So if you're, if you're just modeling a single dipole, all you need to do is fit its location, its orientation, and the strength of that dipole. But as I mentioned, this is, this is really only uh, of good in certain situations, for example, early sensory responses. So what a lot of people use is called a distributed or imaging approach. And this approach assumes that the, the whole brain or the cortex could be active. And you, you model this source space by using a grid over the whole brain. So, so similar to MRI, where you would uh, model things as voxels uh, or using a cortical mesh. So you, you constrain the location of each dipole uh, to be at the nodes or vertices of that mesh. So each voxel or node is the, is, gives the location of a dipole source. And here each dipole models the activity of a small brain region. So just corresponding to that local area around that voxel or, or, or node. And the, the downside here is that you have many parameters to be estimated. Um, and so usually we try to reduce that as much as possible. We try to constrain the problem by, uh, for one, constraining the locations of dipoles to be uh, at the locations at these vertices on the mesh or in voxels in, the, in, a, in a volume. Uh, so we can, we can estimate the strength and the orientation at each of those locations, or we can constrain it even further, and I'll talk more about this later, um, by constraining the, the orientation at each, each node in this mesh to be normal, to pointing it in a normal direction from the surface. And then we just have to, to estimate the strength of each dipole at each node. Okay, so when we analyze MEG data, as I, as I mentioned before, we, we typically want to reconstruct the cortical source of activity measured from the sensors. And, and this is known as the inverse problem, and it's a difficult problem uh, because there's many more possible sources of activity than there are sensors. So to solve this problem, we built a generative or forward model of how source activity translates to the measured activity at the sensors. 
So first we assume, like I mentioned before, that synchronous activity in cortical columns sums up to give us a measurable signal, to give us that current dipole. And then we use individual subject anatomy uh, to construct a forward model predicting how source activity at different cortical locations give rise to sensor signals. And so we can use this, this generative forward model to make some predictions. So for source activity at a given position uh, in the brain, what would the sensor activity look like if that's, if that's where our source activity was happening? And then we can compare these two predictions, uh, or multiple predictions, I should say, and see which of, our, which of our predictions best matches the measured data. And so then we, can, we thus can compare these models to determine the most likely source, the most likely location of source activity. And so one of the most uh, important components of these forward models uh, is what's called a lead fields. And th these lead field matrices, they define how the, the sensor activity uh, evoked by a unit strength source is evoked by a unit strength source at a given location and orientation. So for example, uh, for a, a source located here in the brain, lead fields one, two, three, and four uh, tell you what that, that source activity will look like as measured from these different sensors. And this lead field matrix depends on, on several uh, features. So the, the type, the location, and the orientation of the sensors. Uh, it depends on the source space, which I mentioned could be a cortical surface or a volume image. Uh, it depends on the individual head geometry and um, the conductivity of the head tissues. And this can be, this is different obviously for, for EEG and MEG. So there's different types of, of head models that are out there that are used for, for these forward models. So at the, the most simple end of the spectrum, uh, this was used, I think, a lot in the early 90s uh, for MEG. And that's to model the head as sort of a single sphere. Uh, and so the, the issue there is that, as you could probably guess, this is not able to predict the, the electric potential differences at the scalp very accurately or the, or the magnetic signals that we're measuring using MEG. Uh, so there's the local spheres approach, which, which tries to model uh, using several different smaller spheres, what the head looks like. Uh, there's the nulti corrected sphere approach, which is to take a sphere and sort of deform it to be the shape of, of the subject's head, the subject's brain, I should say. Uh, there's the boundary element method, uh, which, which basically models uh, the conductivities of different tissue types. So you have surfaces that represent the, the inner skull, the outer skull, and the scalp. And then uh, at the most extreme end of the, the spectrum here, the most complex, you have the finite element method. Uh, which discretizes this entire volume into into little well, finite elements, little little voxels that each have their own conductivity uh, and properties depending on the type of tissue. And uh, the issue here is that these more complex model models, as you can imagine, are more computationally expensive and require more prior knowledge about the anatomy and the, the conductivity values of the different tissue types. So the most commonly used of these forward models, uh, at least from the work that I'm familiar with, is the, the nulti corrected sphere uh, for MEG, and you'll see this referred to as the single shell model, and for EEG, the, the boundary element method. Okay, and then um, I'm just gonna give a, a really quick overview about the different types of, of source inversion algorithms uh, that are out there. Okay, so as I mentioned before, we, we our lead fields tell us the, the sensitivity of a, a sensor, an MEG or EEG sensor, to a dipole source at a particular location. And this is based on a head model describing the conductivity and geometry of the different tissue types. So we've got our measurement. We've got our activity that we're measuring at all, all of our different sensors, again, using MEG or EEG. And what we want to know is, is where in the brain is this activity coming from? So we, we want to get this, this current density estimate. We want to say, where, where is that coming from? We're going to call that uh, this, this estimation J. And what our forward model gives us is if we already know J, we can multiply that by the lead fields and get a, a predicted uh, distribution of activity at the sensors. So that's what we get from our forward model. But what we really want is, to, is the inverse solution. We want to go from our measurements to the current density estimate. And uh, the way that we do that is we, we try to build this, this matrix W. 
using some prior information. Uh, and so once we have that matrix W, we can multiply it by our sensor measurements and get our, our current density estimate. So get the, the distribution of activity in source space in the brain. And so the way we construct this, this matrix W uh, depends on the source covariance matrix. So that's our, our prior information. So I'll get to that. So first we've got this variable R here, which is the sensor noise that's known. We can, we can easily measure that. We've got L, which is our lead field matrix. Uh, and that's easy to compute. That's, that's the forward model. So that's really straightforward to compute. And then the other component here is the, the source covariance matrix. And so here you've got, this is the matrix here. You've got a, a row and a column for each possible source location, or if you're, if you're not constraining orientation, uh, combinations of orientation and location. And so that's going to be our prior information. And so each, each element here in the diagonal corresponds to a particular location and orientation, if you're, if you're fitting orientation as well, in the brain. Okay, and so this really all of the, uh, the source inversion algorithms out there can be at least viewed in this way. And all that they differ by in, for the most part is their, their source covariance matrix. So what prior information they use. So for a single dipole fit, your, your source covariance matrix just has one single element and that's gonna be the, the location of that one dipole. And so you can you can use that and just get one little tiny location in the brain and see if that prediction matches your your measured activity. In this case, it doesn't. So I should say, yeah, if you if you if you tried to fit it at this location, you'd get a prediction that doesn't match very well. If you tried to fit it at this location, you get a prediction that matched better. And so you'd say, well, this is the most likely source of, of the activity that you're measuring. You can also fit this with, with two dipoles. And so in that case, you just have two elements in the diagonal here of your source covariance matrix. You can do another popular method, uh, which is more in the, the distributed imaging approach is a minimum norm. Okay, and that just assumes a, a diagonal matrix. So with the ones and all the, the diagonals here, uh, and that's basically fitting the activity at each location in the brain that, that each of these sources uh, corresponds to. And so there you'll get a, a more distributed estimate of the activity that gives rise to that, that measured uh, sensor signal. Okay, another really popular approach are the, the beam former or adaptive or algorithms or empirical algorithms. And basically the idea here is that you're going to estimate or, or use some method to, to compute the source covariance matrix from the data itself. Uh, and this is a, a whole family of methods that, that I won't go into one because of lack of expertise, but, but two, because there's already really good um, talks about this in the SPM MEG uh, course lecture notes. Okay, and so just to summarize, there, there's a lot of popular uh, source inversion algorithms out there. Uh, and you can really view these as, as sort of families of the same thing, just using different source covariance priors. Okay, so now, now I'll get to, to what I really want to talk about, which is doing the source inversion uh, in, a, in some practical steps on how to do it using cortical surfaces. So I mentioned there's the, the equivalent current dipole approach and then the, the distributed imaging approach. And within the distributed imaging approach, you can use either brain volumes or surfaces. And uh, for, for several different reasons, I prefer to use surfaces. Okay, so what do we need to do that? The ingredients that we need are, are each subject's MRI. We need the, the coordinates of the fiducial coil location. So if you're using uh, MEG, you typically have these, these fiducial coils that the, the MEG, uh, the MEG can, machine can, can sense and can sense the location of, and we need to match those up to where they are in the subject's head. We need a cortical surface derived from that subject's MRI. And then optionally, and I'll talk about this at the end, we need the, the dipole orientations. Okay. So what do we need for, for the subject's MRI? The minimum requirement is a, a T1 weighted image, uh, which we'll use with FreeSurfer for segmentation and surface extraction. In more recent versions of FreeSurfer, you can run, uh, run this with a T2 or a flare image as well. 
and that can help improve the peel surfaces uh, if you're going to use those in your source reconstruction. And then uh, multi-parameter maps have become more and more popular recently, and this is possible to it is possible to use them, um, but it requires some specialized scripts to extract the surfaces to be able to run those through FreeSurfer. And so, if anyone's interested in in doing that, uh, I invite you to send me an email, and we, we can talk about that. Okay. The the next ingredient that we need are the fiducial coordinates. So you need at least three. Uh, to map the, the MRI and the surface coordinates to the, the MEG or EEG sensor positions. And so really it can be any three points in the head. Um, you can just use the default locations uh, from SPM. So if you don't know where they are, what SPM will do is fit a warp, a template uh, scalp and, and brain to your subject's MRI. And on that template, it knows where the, the left uh, and right uh, parts of the ear are. This is the periarcular point, I think. Somebody can correct me on that. Uh, as well as the nasian. And these points are typically used because they're they're on rigid parts of the, the scalp, um, which don't really move that much uh, as the face is moved. So that can help with the, the localization as these, these remain motionless. So that, that's the most basic thing you can do if you don't know where they are. Uh, what's better is uh, when you do a, your subject's MRI, you can put some vitamin E capsules uh, where you're going to put these fiducial coils. So if you're using MEG, where you'll put the fiducial coils in the brain, and then you can get the coordinates uh, from those images. Uh, but what I, what I think is probably the best thing to do, which is, is what we have been doing at UCL when I was there and what we're now doing uh, here in Lyon, is to, based on the individual subject's MRI, we use a uh, we build a 3D printed head cast. So we use a, a 3D CAD program to design this head cast so that the inside of the cast fits the outside of the subject scalp perfectly. And it has several indentations inside the, the mask where you can pop in your fiducial coils. And then the outside is made to fit the inside of the doer perfectly. So when the subject's in there, it looks like this. These are the wires coming out from the fiducial coils. And so every time the subject's in there, we know exactly where that fiducial coil is. We know the, the coordinates of that fiducial coil um, in the subject's MRI native space. And that's because that's the way we designed the, the head cast. So now we know, we know the exact coordinates and we can use those in the source inversion, as I'll show you soon. Okay, the next thing we need is a, a cortical surface derived from the MRI. So the most basic thing you can do is, is if you you don't even have an MRI of the subject, you can use an SPM at least to the, the template brain, the template surface. Okay, the, the next best thing you can do is, is let's say you, you have the MRI, but you haven't run it through FreeSurfer and you don't have individual cortical surfaces. SPM can warp the template surface to the subject's MRI. So that's a, a slightly better way to do it. Uh, but the best way to do it is if you use these individualized surfaces from FreeSurfer. So I'm gonna focus on, on how to do this method. So the first thing that you need to do is create the, the white matter and the peel surfaces. And this is basically involves running uh, the free surfer command recon all. Uh, it used to take at least, I think, 24 hours on a standard computer for a single subject. But now I think with free surfer 7.1, it's considerably faster. And so you just run recon all, uh, you give your subject a, a name here. And then the, the input, you give the path to the, the T1, I should say, T1 volume here. Yeah, path to the, the input T1. And then you give it also the, the option, if you, if you have it, a T2, and you give the path to the T2 volume. Okay? And then you add this command to, to use that T2 to construct the, the peel surface, or to help construct the peel surface. Okay, and this will create in your, your FreeSurfer directory, which is, is here by default, in the, under the subjects directory, in a directory named after whatever name you gave your subject, these four surfaces. So you'll have the left hemisphere and right hemisphere peel surface, and the left hemisphere and right hemisphere white matter surface. And then uh, if, you're, if you're doing EEG, you'll also wanna create the skull and scalp surfaces if you're using the boundary element method for your forward model uh, with EEG. 
And so then you want to run this command, this MRI watershed method, uh, also part of FreeSurfer. And this will create inside your, your subject's uh, directory in the BEM directory, uh, these three surfaces, which you'll need later on. So the inner skull, outer skull, and outer skin. Okay, but that's not all, because now we, we need to post-process these free surfer surfaces. So the steps here, uh, first we need to convert them to, to Gifty format, adjust their coordinates, combine the hemispheres and downsample. Uh, and if you're interested, I have a, a GitHub repository called MegSurfer, uh, which contains a, a script called post-process free surfer surfaces that does all of these steps as well as a few others, if you want to check that out. Okay, so first SPM uh, and field trip, if you're using that, they use the Gifty format for cortical surfaces, whereas uh, FreeSurfer uses its own sort of binary format. So converting is pretty easy. Uh, built into FreeSurfer, there's this MRIS convert. So you just give it the name of your surface and then the, the new name of the surface that you want to convert it to in, in Gifty format, Gifty format, however you want to say that. You want to do that for all of your surfaces, left and right hemisphere, peel and white matter, and if you did the, the BEM surfaces, those as well. And in SPM and field trip, they include this, this Gifty class. Uh, and so you can use it to load your surfaces. So if you do that, you can load it just like this, giving it the file name, and you'll get back a, a structure with the faces. So it's got a whole lot of faces, 335,942. Uh, each of them connects to, these are triangular faces, so each of them connects to three vertices. Um, don't worry about that one for now. We can talk about that later if you want. And then vertices. So here's a list of all the vertices or, or nodes in that matrix, in that in that surface. Okay, so the next thing you need to do is, is convert or adjust the, the surface coordinates. And this is because in FreeSurfer, uh, it creates these surfaces using this RAS coordinate system. And we need to put them back into the subject's MRI coordinate space, back into their native space. I guess you could do vice versa if you want, but I'll, I'll just show you how to do it this way. And so to do that, you just run MRI info and you give it uh, in your free surfer subjects directory in the subject that you created. There's an MRI directory and there's a orig.mgz um, uh, volume there. So you just pass it with this CRAS. Um, option and that'll give you this three element vector which is the the ras coordinate at the center of the volume and then all you have to do is add this vector to each surface vertex coordinate um, in your surface and so there's there's some code to do that here you just load in your you get the surface add that offset to each vertex and then save your surface again okay the next thing you need to do is combine the two hemispheres so FreeSurfer, as you've seen, generates a separate surface for each hemisphere, uh, but SPM wants a single surface. And again, if you, if you check out MegSurfer, there's a function there called combine surfaces, where you just pass it the names of two different surfaces um, and then the, the name of the combined surface. And so that'll create a, a gifty surface, in this case called peel.gii. And the first half of the vertices and faces are from the left hemisphere and the second half from the right. And we'll see uh, another situation where you can use this later. Okay, the next thing is to downsample the surfaces. And so uh, free, this is because free surfers, at least if you use high resolution MRI, uh, they have too many vertices, about 300,000. And I mean, I don't know about your computer, but that, that'll kill my RAM, but it's probably not a good idea uh, to run source inversion with that many source locations anyway. So we want to downsample the surface by maintaining the shape as much as possible, but reducing the number of vertices. And so if you're just using one surface, which is sort of the standard way to do things, if you're just using the white matter or the peel surface uh, for source reconstruction, you can use this free server command called MRIS decimate. You give it the, the proportion that you want to decimate by the name of the surface and the, the name of the new one. And this will create this downsampled surface, in this case, downsampled by a factor of 10. So it'll have about 30,000 vertices. Um, but if you're using two surfaces, and we'll, we'll talk a bit about that later for the laminar analysis, there's a function in MegSurfer, which I'll describe later on as well, called decimate two surfaces. And it'll, it'll decimate these together 
uh, by a factor of 10. And we'll talk later about how it does that and maintains this uh, correspondence between them. So that, that's more important if you're doing laminar analysis. OK, so let's put this all together. So in MATLAB, you can start SPM by typing SPM EEG. Uh, click Batch. Then in, inside the Batch Editor, and again, there, there's good documentation and tutorials and walkthroughs on this on the SPM website. Uh, but just to show you how to do these steps, you can go to MEEG, Source Reconstruction, Head Model Specification. You'll get something like this. Here for MEEG datasets, you can select your, your MEEG dataset that you want to run inversion on. And for now, you could keep the inversion index here at one. And what this is, the inversion index and the comment are so that you can run multiple inversions on a single data set and add comments. So um, we'll use this later for the laminar analysis uh, where we'll run inversion once with the white matter surface and once with the peel surface, for example. Uh, but for now, you could keep those at one and, and you can leave the comment blank if you like. Okay, the next step is to, to select the mesh source. source. So you have a few options here. So you can select template, which is, as I, as I described earlier, just using the template surface. You can select individual structural image, and then you'll just uh, specify the subject's MRI, and its SPM will warp the template service, surface to their MRI. Or you can select custom meshes, uh, which we, you can use the, the meshes that you've generated from, from FreeSurfer. Okay, so if we select custom meshes, then there's a few other options that appear. So first is to select the, the individual structural image. And this was the MRI that you used to run FreeSurfer. So not the, the MGZ files in the FreeSurfer directory, but the one that you, you gave FreeSurfer when you ran recon all. Okay. Then for the, the custom cortical mesh, you can use either the, the downsampled peel surface or the downsampled white matter surface after running the previous pre-processed, post-processing steps. I think um, what's most common is to use the, the white matter surface for, for several reasons. Okay. And then if you're doing uh, EEG, you can specify the, the custom inner skull, outer skull, and scalp meshes. Um, you can also, if you're using MEG, you can leave these blank. Uh, I think they're just blank by default um, because you're, you're not going to use the, the BEM forward model anyway, most likely. Okay, and then the next step is to, to specify the co-registration parameters. So when you look at the, the fiducial section here, you've got, you can add as many of them as you like. Uh, for each of them, you give them a label. So here I've given NAS, LPA, and RPA. So the nasian, the left ear, and the right ear. And when you click on how to specify, you have the option to, to select from a list and that's, as I mentioned before, to use the standard locations on the template brain. Or you can select type MRI coordinates. And in that case, for each uh, fiducial location, you can, you can type in your, your MRI coordinate. And that should be you know, in the same space as your, your MRI that you've entered here for the individual structural image. OK, and then the next step is to pick the forward model that you want. And by default, it uses uh, EEG BEM for the EEG head model and the single shell for the MEG head model. And uh, I would just leave those um, as they are, unless you're, you're for some reason have some specific uh, reason to pick another forward model or you want to compare forward models. Okay, and then just click Run. And then in the, the graphics window, it'll show you the result of this co-registration. And if you, usually I, I would say to stop here on each subject to evaluate these results before you, you go and build a sort of complex batch script that does this and then goes on to do source reconstruction and, and everything else. So what this might look like if, you, if you've made some mistakes somewhere. So here you can see uh, in green, these green circles are the location of each MEG sensor. In blue here is our, our individual structural uh, or individual mesh, our surface. And then in black are, are the BEM uh, surfaces. And so this is an example where the, the RIS offset, that step wasn't applied to the BEM surfaces. So you can see the, the brain mesh looks about where it should be relative to the MEG sensors. 
but these uh, scalp and, and skull meshes are, are way outside. So that's one, one problem you might see. Here's a case where the, the BEM meshes look good with respect to the sensors, but the, the brain is offset. And that's because this, this RIS offset wasn't applied to the cortical surface. Okay. Here's an example where the, the brain surface and the BEM surfaces look like they're unregistered to each other. That's fine. Um, but you can be pretty sure that your subject wasn't facing upwards uh, inside the MEG scanner. And in this case, I had just entered the, the fiducial coordinates incorrectly. And this is what it should look like if you've done everything right. So the, the BEM surfaces and the cortical surfaces should be lining up. And the, the position and orientation of the, the brain and the, the scalp and the skull should look reasonable uh, within the, the MEG sensors. And you can click on this image and rotate it in three dimensions to make sure everything's good. Okay, so then you, now that you've done your, your co-registration, you can go ahead and do source reconstruction. Um, and I won't go into all the options here because, again, that, that's better covered in the SPM course. Uh, but basically, you want to do SPM in your batch editor, MEEG, source reconstruction. And you can do source inversion. There's an iterative version of that. And then um, if anybody wants to talk about this later, I'm working on a, a sliding window version of that, which will be coming soon. Okay. And then you'll get these, these options in your source inversion module. And you want to pick the, the M or EEG data set that you had done the, the head model specification step on. Use the same inversion index that you used before. So if you, you use the inversion index 1, specify 1 here. And then you, you can set different parameters of the inversion. So time window, frequency window, whether or not you want to apply a Hanning window, all kinds of stuff. But we won't go into that now. OK, so, so that's how to do source inversion using individual subjects' cortical surface. Uh, but now I'll go through sort of how to use multiple surfaces to do laminar comparisons. Uh, okay. So the main way we can do this, well, in order to be able to, to do a laminar comparison, what we need is a generative model of the sensor activity, so a forward model that includes representations of at least deep and superficial cortical lamina. So to build this model, we first extract the, the peel and white matter surfaces uh, from each subject's MRI. And so that's using the steps that we described earlier with FreeSurfer. And then to constrain this model electrophysiologically, we use the fact that, that layer two and three pyramidal cells will contribute the most to the cumulative dipole moment on the peel surface and the layer five cells to the, the dipole moment on the white matter surface. So the peel surface in these cases are gonna represent the superficial layers and the white matter surface is gonna represent the deep layers. And then we can strain the, the orientation of these cells to be normal to the surface. Uh, this is how the dendrites are oriented in pyramidal cells. But we'll talk more about this in the last part of the talk. And then finally, we include this notion of recurrent connectivity uh, amongst these cells. So we don't we model activation not as a single dipole, but as a as a patch with some spatial extent. Okay, and there's two main ways to to do this sort of laminar comparison. Uh, so first, there's the the laminar uh, model comparison approach, and so this is doing um, Bayesian comparison of competing generative models. So we fit one generative model, assuming that all the activity is happening on the peel surface, representing the superficial layers. And then we fit another model, uh, assuming that all the activity is occurring on the white matter surface, so representing the deep layers. And we can compare these two models in terms of how well they fit the same data set. And uh, the fit metric that we use is model evidence uh, approximated by free energy. And so uh, this is, this is nice. Free energy is a nice metric, I think, at least, because it can capture the trade-off between accuracy and complexity. So the model has to accurately fit the data, but not be so complex that it's in danger of overfitting. And uh, without going into the details of what free energy is um, and how it's computed, you can sort of think of it as cost validation error. So um, it's not computed in the same way, but in a, in a recent neuroimage paper, I think it was this one, yeah, neuroimage 2018, we showed that the, the relative 
free energy between two models is is strikingly highly highly correlated with the the relative uh, cross validation error. Okay. So if we want to compare two models, uh, the relative evidence is given by the Bayes factor. So the the probability of the data given one model over the probability of the data given the other model, and we take the log of that. And uh, so that's that's we can approximate this then by just the the difference in free energy between the two models. So how do we how do we do this comparison in practice? We run two different source inversions on the same data set. So we run one uh, using the peel surface. So you can see here the inversion index is set to one, and I've just added a, a comment here that this is with the peel surface. We specify the peel surface for the the cortical mesh. Do our source inversion using whatever parameters you like, using inversion index one. And then we do another one using the white matter surface. And so here we've got inversion index two. I've just added a comment. This is with the white matter. Uh, for the cortical mesh, we're using the downsampled white matter surface. And then we do our source inversion uh, using that same inversion index two. Okay. And then to, to get the, the free energy difference, all you have to do is to, to load that inverted data set in SPM using the SPM EEG load method. And then this, this term right here will give you the free energy for model one, and this one, the free energy for model two. We can just subtract those to get the F difference. Um, and typically uh, for free energy differences, we use a, a threshold of significance of plus or minus three. And that means that, that one model is about 20 times more likely than the other. And if, uh, if you're interested, so I've got um, one paper here showing that in simulation, if we simulate sources on either the peel or the white matter surface, and then we run this sort of model uh, comparison approach using different levels of noise, different levels of co-registration error, that this, this technique is able to most of the time uh, correctly reconstruct the, the, the laminar location of that source activity. Uh, and then later there's a, there's a follow-up paper using this to, to determine whether or not activity in different frequency bands, so like in, in alpha, beta, or gamma, occurs deep or superficially. Check that out if you're interested. Okay, another way to do this is a, is a ROI analysis. This is a bit different. So here, rather than run two different source inversions, we can do source inversion on a combined peel and white matter surface. So you combine these two surfaces into sort of like a, a sandwich. Um, and you, you run your source inversion using that combined surface. And then you can define an ROI uh, however you like. This can be you know, based on an fMRI uh, result. It can be uh, some sort of thresholding based on where you see a change in activity on either surface. And then within that ROI, uh, you can compare source activity across the two surfaces. So in this case, in this eLife paper, we were looking at where you see a greater change in power from the baseline. And so when you do this, this comparison, if that is negative, it means that, that that power changed more in that frequency band on the, the white matter surface or the deep layers, and if it's positive on the superficial surface, superficial layers, uh, peel surface. So in order to, to do this, we can create this combined surface mesh, again, using the combined surfaces method from MegSurfer. And here we're gonna combine the white matter and the peel surface into this a surface called white peel. Okay. And the result, we get a, a gifty surface called white peel, where the first half of the vertices and faces are from the downsampled white matter surface, and the second half are from the downsampled peel surface. And so this is just a sort of cross section of what that looks like, uh, where the red here is showing the the original white matter surface and the, the blue showing the original peel surface. And then you can just run source inversion using that combined mesh. You can use the, the rest of the SPM functions like to get the results of the source inversion and it'll give you a, each vertex in this combined mesh uh, what the, the source activity looks like. And you just split that in half. So first half of the vertices again are from the, in this case, the white matter surface, second half are from the peel surface. Uh, so you can then, then compare the two within your, your ROI. 
Okay, and so last, uh, I had talked a little bit about dipole orientation. And so uh, I just want to quickly say at least what, what I think is the, the best way to, to estimate the, the dipole orientation based on how we think cortical columns are oriented. So uh, during the course of some of my laminar work, I ran into this problem where I wanted to, at, a, at an even finer scale that within an ROI, I wanted at each vertex to compare uh, what the activity was in that cortical column across the, the deep and superficial layers. Um, but to do that, I needed to identify corresponding vertices on the white matter and peel surface that represent the ends of that cortical column. And so free surfer, the way it works is it, it segments the white matter and creates a surface and then generates the peel surface by expanding this white matter surface out. And, and this is nice. Um, so it gives for each white matter surface vertex, you get a corresponding vertex on the peel surface. But as I mentioned before, these surfaces are too big and we, we have to, to downsample them. And uh, in the past, I used this MRIS decimate method from FreeSurfer, but when you do that separately on the white matter and the peel surface, it destroys this correspondence. So it's not clear for a given vertex on the peel surface, what's the corresponding vertex on the white matter surface. And so given a vertex on the downsampled surface, uh, on the peel surface, how do we find the corresponding one on the downsampled white matter surface? So one approach that you can take to do this is to find the nearest vertex on the original non-downsampled peel surface, then get the corresponding vertex on the non-downsampled white matter surface, because we know that, that here there's this correspondence built in from FreeSurfer. Then once you've got that, find the nearest vertex on the, the downsampled white matter surface. So it's a bit of a faff, uh, but the problem here is that the, the mapping that you get is not one-to-one, -one, and that's based on the way MRIS decimate works, which is not ideal. So the, the new solution that, that me and some of my colleagues came up with um, is to use MATLAB's reduce patch function on the peel surface, and this function only removes vertices uh, and then retessellates, so it doesn't create new vertices. Then we remove those same vertices from the white matter surface. And finally, we, we copy the edges from the newly downsampled peel surface to the newly downsampled white matter surface. And since we just removed the same vertices um, from both surfaces, this approach preserves the vertex correspondence between them. Uh, but then I thought, well, the mesh faces that we get are different than the ones we get from MRIS decimate. So what could possibly go wrong? So I asked a, a few of my colleagues um, exactly how the, these surfaces are used uh, in constructing these forward models. And what I found is that, that they're used in two ways. So, so what I've been talking to you about before, about how we, we constrain dipole locations to get these surface vertices. So that was pretty clear. But then what I found out was that the dipole orientations are constrained to be normal to the surface, which, which I kind of knew. But when I found out how that, that's done, if you want to find the, the, normal, uh, the normal vertex, the normal vector at a given vertex, what you do is you look at the normal vectors at the adjacent faces and average them to get the, the, the normal vector for that vertex. And so that means that uh, we're changing, we're changing the, the dipole orientations potentially by this new downsampling method. So then I thought, what about the standard downsampling process? Just using MRIS decimate from FreeSurfer, surely this changes the, the normal vector orientations, um, but by how much? And so the answer that I, I found is a lot. Um, so this is showing for, for different subjects, the distribution of the vector angle difference uh, at each vertex in the, the cortical surface. And the, the dotted lines here are showing the mean for each subject. And so the, the difference between the normal vectors and the original and the downsampled surface can be nearly 20 degrees. Uh, so then I thought, well, what's the best way to, to estimate these orientations? Is, is doing this, this sort of surface normal approach even a good way to do it at all? And uh, so I, I contacted uh, another colleague, uh, Conrad Vogstel, who's an expert on computational anatomy and ask them uh, what are the different ways that we can, we can estimate cortical column orientation. 
And so there's basically two families, two approaches. There's these single mesh methods. So we can, on the downsampled surface, get the, the normal vectors at each vertex, like I just said, taking the average of the, the normal vector at each face uh, surrounding the vertex. There's cortical patch statistics, uh, which averages the surface normals of nearby patches from the original surface. Or because we've maintained, we've just removed some vertices from the original surface, we can use the original surface normals uh, and, and at the vertices that we still have in the downsampled mesh. And then there's, there's mesh correspondence methods, uh, which use two surfaces to define orientations. And so here we have the link vectors method. So again, because of the way that FreeSurfer creates the two different meshes, the white matter and the peel mesh, by expanding one out, we can just use a vector that links corresponding vertices on, on each surface. And then the, there's a more complex variational vector field method, uh, which is similar. Um, so it, it constructs a field of correspondence vectors and constrains them to be approximately normal to the surface, um, but also parallel to each other. Okay, so then I wanted to see just how different are the, the vectors that each of these methods generates. And uh, here the answer is they're, they're very different. So the, the downsampled surface normals, cortical patch statistics, and original surface normals are the most similar to each other. Uh, but these other methods can vary from each other by, by as much as 30 degrees on average. So then I, I wanted to say, okay, well, which one's the best? And I, I won't go into to too much detail on this, but basically I used uh, random effects family level Bayesian inference uh, using three different types of evoked responses over multiple participants. And, and this is a way to sort of combine um, this sort of free energy or, or Bayesian uh, model evidence um, comparison to combine that over, over multiple um, evoked responses and subjects and see what's the exceedance probability. So what's the, the probability that one of these methods uh, has higher model evidence than the others? And so what I found was that by far overall, uh, the link vectors method uh, was the best. And this is followed by the variational vector field method. Um, however, if, you're, if you use one of these single surface methods, it's best to use the, the peel surface to compute them. So yeah, link vector is best, followed by variational vector field. Peel is the best for computing orientation if you use a, a single surface uh, method. Okay, so how do, how do we do this in practice? Um, I have another GitHub repository for that project, which includes a, a new version of this um, SPM method for computing the gain matrix. And so what you can do is load up your, your surface that you want to use for source inversion. There's another function in that, that repository called compute surface normals, uh, where you give it the, the directory of your subject, your subject's directory in FreeSurfer, the name of your subject, the, the surface that you want to compute the normals for, and the method that you want to use. So in this case, link vector. And so it sets this, this normals attribute of that gifty object and then you just save your gifty object. And if you've replaced your, your version in SPM of this, this function, SPM will use this attribute for computing the lead field, so for, for determining the orientation of the dipoles, uh, so if it exists. If you pass it a, a gifty object where this doesn't exist, that's fine. It'll just compute the, the dipole orientations using the surface normals as, as default. OK, so just to summarize, uh, with FreeSurfer and some post-processing, you can use individual subject cortical meshes for source inversion. And I invite you to check out this repository, and hopefully some of that will be useful to you, and hopefully you can contribute as well. Uh, I've showed two different types of, of laminar analysis, so this model comparison approach as well as a, a combined mesh approach, and found that, that link vectors are better approximations of cortical column orientation than surface normals. So this should be easy. It's implemented. It's not implemented yet in SPM unless you, you use the patch that I've provided, um, but it should be easy to implement there and then any other um, MEG analysis uh, toolbox. So I just wanted to thank you all and to, to thank my collaborators as well as uh, the, the folks at Brainbox. And uh, yeah, I invite you to, to ask any questions. Cheers, Jimmy. Thank you for doing that yeah. talk. Not only for doing such a clear one, but when you go to these sorts of talks, usually you'll watch the slides and be like, yep, yeah, I understand that. But when you come to coding it, it's an absolute nightmare. <laughs> Having the GitHub stuff available as well is really helpful. So thank you to that. Thank you.
So we got we got one question, but unfortunately, I have some as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first one is: Do you need the same number of virtual sources on um, white and grey matter surfaces? Um, strictly speaking, no. So, so for example, if you do in the model comparison approach, I think so. Uh, yeah, yeah, strictly speaking, no. But in that case, it's not a fair comparison. So I would say that that yes. And if you if you use the the decimate two surfaces function that that's in my my repository, that'll leave you with the same number of vertices on each each mesh. And so then it would be a fair comparison. Yeah. Cool. Um, my one is something that I've read about, and I think I understand, but I'm not sure. Uh, so you mentioned free energy when you were talking about uh, evaluating models. Well, how would you define free energy? <laughs> so it's basically, I think it's the, the, the log likelihood um, minus the the kolbach liebler divergence between the the priors and the posterior that's the i think that's the the formal way but i think it, it's base it's basically like aic and bic where it's it's accuracy minus complexity right um and that, that shouldn't be confused with the the free energy principle um which yes. is the idea yeah that the brain might might try to to maximize free energy so that is my on to my next question um with the with obviously the free energy principle is like a way of inferring how the brain works and from that there's a relationship between the phase of a gamma oscillation and the phase and amplitude of an alpha oscillation for instance and some people have postulated that deeper layers may be the source of alpha and more superficial layers might be the source of gamma could these sorts of techniques be applied to understand those phase amplitude relationships a bit further sorry that was a very long question <laughs> yeah um i don't know about phase amplitude that might be more difficult but i in my one of my papers i i looked at power so where the change in power was greater um and yeah i found that alpha was deep and gamma was superficial but i would say that um one of the limitations of of this approach um and it may be a fundamental limitation i don't know is that it, it only tells you where more activity is occurring so mm -hmm. if activity could be occurring at both layers and and you wouldn't know okay. you wouldn't be able to distinguish that from it just happening in one layer got you thank you for that and whilst we'll be asking those a few more flowed in um great stuff jimmy have you ever used any of the free surfer atlases during source reconstruction would you need to downsample the atlases um Let's see. I haven't, but I don't think you would need to. Um, if I recall correctly, I think there's like an annotation file where you can get the 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 region in the atlas for each vertex. Um, if you've mapped the the subject surface to the FS average surface, and because the downsampling approach that I that I showed here just removes vertices. Then you could just go for each vertex and look in the in the atlas at the corresponding one. Thank you for that. And then the next one is: Have you ever tried to model white matter lesions from stroke within free surfer and consequent abnormal laminar source activity? Ooh, yeah, I've never never tried that with with free surfer. Um. Yeah, I, no, I have no idea what that would do to the the laminar uh, comparison. So the the difficulty, yeah, is that if you've got a white matter lesion, then that could disrupt your white matter surface, and you would have to take care and make sure that there was still in the part that you were interested in enough separation between the white matter and peel surface um, to really separate out the sources there. Or it could be, you know, that you just exclude if you're if you're not interested in the actual location of the legion, but like surrounding areas, you might you might have to exclude that region. Okay, thank you. So we've got two more left. Uh, for laminar reconstruction, do you strictly need to use a head cast during the MEG data collection? 
Alternatively, what would your threshold for accepted participant movements be during data acquisition? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I have never tried it on data without headcasts, but I did some simulations to show, and they showed, I think, that the, the co-registration error had to be, I think, below three millimeters. And um, I think that could be achievable without head, well, I mean, you can, you can see why that is, right? Because the, the cortical thickness, it varies across the brain, but it can be around like two to four millimeters. So if your co-registration error is, is larger than that, you're not going to be able to distinguish activity in different layers. Um, okay. So it could be possible, but I don't know. So you did break up a bit then. Um, did you say that as long as the registration error is between two or four millimeters, it should be able to distinguish between the sources you were talking about? Yeah, so I, I think it needs to be at least lower than, than three millimeters because the okay. cortical thickness is around two to four. Okay. Um, I think typically with Meg, without head cast, you're at five, but it varies. I think people can achieve better or worse than that. Cool. Thank you for that. And then thanks a lot for a super clear talk. Two questions on quality checks and validation. Do you have any specific quality checks for the free surfer output that you do and for the laminar analysis, is there validation of the source model? So for the, the free surfer output, what I typically do is to load up in like Freeview, the, the GUI that comes with, with free surfer, the MRI, as well as both uh, the white matter and peel surface, and just sort of go through them and make sure that, for example, there's no parts where they intersect. Um, I found that if you do this on lower resolution MRI, sometimes you'll get these sort of spikes from the white matter surface that intersect with the peel surface. And, and you just want to, you know, go through the standard free surfer uh, recommended process for, for making sure that the, the surfaces are okay. They aren't excluding any parts of the brain and it might require some, some manual correction of the surfaces, but there's, there's some pretty good tutorials on the free surfer webpage for how to do that. Um, and for the laminar analysis, for the source model, well, um, at least uh, the results that I found using this analysis um, seem to fit with a lot of the, the more invasive recording data from, from monkeys, for example. Um, but there is a, a debate you know, on, on where uh, activity in different frequency bands localizes. And some people say that there's, you know, for example, alpha in the deep and the superficial layers. Um, but like I mentioned, this one limitation of this technique is that it can only tell you where that can be strongest. And I found that it was strongest in the deep layers. And, and I think that that matches with what some people think that sort of the, the pacemaker activity for alpha rhythm is in the deep layers. Great stuff. Thanks for that. And I thought I'd be, I asked the question really badly, but you managed to get it all fine, which is good. Um, have you got two more now and then we'll call it a day because we're running out of time. Okay. Uh, so somebody has asked another question in the meantime, uh, but I, is it okay if I forward yeah. it on to you via email? Sure, sure. So Gabriel, uh, we, your crash question will be answered, uh, but I'll just get Jimmy to answer it via email. So I apologize. Uh, so the first one is, does free surfer work optimally for adult brains? And could these methods be adopted for older or younger T1 scans? Yes, that is true that um, free surfer is optimized for the adult brain. I don't know about older brains, but um, there are groups that are trying to to optimize it for infant brains, for example, uh, you know, which is difficult because the, the white matter, gray matter contrast flips at a certain age. Um, I know people are doing it and I, I am interested in doing that as well, but I, I've never done it myself. Great stuff. And now finally for the last one before we start to go, how do you relate these approaches to the difference between freely oriented versus fixed oriented forward models? Yeah, so um, in practice, I've, I've only done the fixed oriented forward models, but uh, based on some reviewer comments for the, the dipole orientation paper, they asked us, what if we do some loose um, orientation constraints to allow the, the dipole orientation to, to, to move a bit? And that's fine, but what we found is that that will sort of, for most of the time, be penalized by, by free energy um, because it's a much more complex model. So for each source, you're adding at least another parameter, even if you just add one orthogonal direction. 
Um, and so the, the model has to be much, the, the, the fit to the data has to be much higher in order to, to justify that increase in complexity. Got you. So thank you for that. And thank you very much. For the talk and for taking the time to answer the question so clearly and for such a, a clear talk. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah.